in IRA. Then he joined IRA as a scientist. Then he became a principal scientist in 2010. In 2010. Then later he moved to uh, University of Arizona, University of California as a visiting fellow. And there his real success story started. So there he got a lot of papers in the reputed genus like Nature, PNAS, Trends in Plant Science, Genes and Development. And those are all very key papers actually in the field of ABA signaling, cold stress, and SARNA, microRNA. So without citing those papers, it is very difficult to write those papers in those fields actually. So those are the very key papers in those reputed journals. And he got many awards like uh, ICR, Javarila Nehru Award, and Boys Cause Fellowship, and JJ Sinai Gold Medal Award, several awards, and the list is endless, actually. And he is a very key person for establishing this World Bank funded uh, Nahib Cause project. And he is the person behind the success of the phenomic facility that you guys visited a few days back. So without further delay, uh, I, on behalf of everybody, I request Sad to deliver the lecture. Thank you, sir. Environmental factor increases from 0 to say 100. So the growth start increasing at it reaches uh, uh, maximum at optimum level of growth factor then after that it decreases. So the response of uh, the genotype these are some example it may be a water temperature nutrient light. So the response of the genotype is like this like uh, some genotype they may have higher uh, growth or yield when the uh, optimum factor is less quantity, whereas some other factor it may need, even uh, for the starting the growth, it may need more amount of factor. So there is variation uh, in this range, as well as there is a lot of variation in the uh, range where the growth factor exceeds. So in this case of uh, plant responses, the tolerant genotype may res respond like this, and susceptible genotype may respond in this way. So uh, these are some of the factors. So it may be water deficit, hypoxia, anoxia, or temperature, it may be high or low. 
nutrient also uh, like when it is deficient or if it is uh, toxic, it is a problem, light is also low and high. There are several other factors which are not required for uh, the plant growth and they can also uh, cause stress to the plants. These factors are include ion toxicity which are caused under salinity, alkalinity or it is caused by the heavy metal. And the uh, uh, proton concentration in the soil is essential because often the nutrient availability or uh, the uh, growth of the root in the soil depends upon the soil pH. So each nutrient availability is determined by a certain range of pH. So if the pH is uh, very high or it is very low, then also it affects the growth. Although the hydrogen ion concentration per se is not required for the plant growth, it produces a condition which is necessary for the nutrient uptake and the growth of the root in the medium. Uh, air pollutants, it may be a gases or it may be just particle matters which is that are deposited on the leaf, like if, especially if you go walk around uh, in the campus, you can see a lot of particulate uh, deposit on the leaf. So they also affect a gas exchange process as well as light interception and thus they affect the yield. And uh, the UVB radiation which was a major problem earlier, but now because of the ozone hole and other thing, now uh, since the ozone hole is uh, cured, so this problem is less. So in this, if you see the uh, response of the plant, it is highly contrast to uh, the response of the plant uh, for the essential growth factor. So here you can have a resistant genotype. Whatever the stress is there, the plant will not bother. It will be resistant. It will uh, grow irrespective of the concentration of the uh, non-essential environmental factor. Whereas some of the tolerant genotype, it may tolerate to a certain extent, then after that you will see a sensitivity. And the susceptible genotype, the slope is larger when compared to the tolerant genotype. And also the critical tolerance level may vary between the tolerant and susceptible genotype. So we should understand this when we talk of stress tolerance, we, we cannot talk of tolerance to drought versus a tolerant to other abiotic stresses often we think that we can generate a resistant plant, uh, drought resistant plant or temperature resistant plant. That is not possible because uh, when the stress is caused by an essential environment factor, you can have only uh, the plant of a tolerant type. If it is non-essential factor, there is a possibility to develop a resistant plant. Yes. <laughs> so in the nutrient, I put only the uh, essential uh, elements. So if it is no, caused by non-essential element, then it comes to the uh, toxicity. If it is all the elements which are present in the soil is not essential. Okay. So that is regarding the soil? Soil, yeah. Or it is regarding to plants? So this is with reference to the plant. Okay. If it is not required, like many elements are not required for the plant, then uh, they are uh, like coming under the uh, toxicity. Yes. So, uh, in order to understand uh, these uh, responses, first we have to understand uh, the mechanism of tolerance or the mechanism of susceptibility and then we have to understand what are the genes that uh, governs the uh, mechanism of tolerance on or susceptibility. Then only we will be able to edit uh, that gene and improve the uh, stress tolerance through genome editing. So this you all know. So uh, the phenotype or the trait which you are interested in, that is either yield, uh, stress tolerance, it is a product of genotype into environment. So when we uh, measure this phenotype, uh, we should uh, measure uh, very critically the environment because that causes the phenotype which we see. But often we ignore uh, the environmental component and that's why there is a lot of difficulty in uh, um, uh, making progress in the uh, stress tolerance research. So what are the different approaches for identification of uh, the uh, genes for uh, stress tolerance or susceptibility? These are uh, some of the uh, approaches I have put. There may be many more. So the most important one is you have to precisely phenotype to identify uh, 
the genotype are mutant which are tolerant or sensitive that is the uh, key. Once you have a germplasm which is clearly uh, tolerant or uh, it is uh, sensitive, then you will be able to identify the genotype that causes, that is the gene or mutant that causes. There are, there are several approaches. Often uh, these approaches uh, like how led to identification of uh, many genes that are involved in the stress tolerance. Although uh, recently we see a lot of these approaches, uh, transcriptome, proteome, metabolome and ionome, these approaches have also generated uh, lot of information, uh, but often they are limited uh, uh, as you know that uh, when you impose uh, stress, you uh, see large uh, number of changes in any of the worms. So that is why it is very difficult to identify what is the causal factor. And also often uh, the uh, stress imposed in many of uh, these studies, if you see they are uh, uh, like uncomparable between the genotype and that also complicates the inference from this. I will give some example for this. So when you uh, impose uh, stress, uh, it is very important to uh, measure the stress in the environment and measure the stress level in the plant and then you see the stress response. These are three important factors for identifying the gene. Otherwise, if you just impose stress and if you identify a gene, you don't know what for the gene is working. Then uh, when you want to deploy the gene in an environment or in a target population of environment where the genotype is going to be cultivated, that gene may or may not work. So that's why you have to measure all these three uh, components. So uh, this is uh, the way you phenotype, you identify a gene that is going to uh, be a, a candidate gene. So if you uh, impose a stress under uh, the field condition, here you see these are rice plants, they are subjected to drought stress and they are grown for like uh, the, the seven days, no irrigation was there, you can see the cracks on the soil, but uh, still you see there is very less obvious symptoms on the plant. So under this condition, if you screen genotype, you will find some are like uh, tolerant and some are gen sensitive. So if you do uh, like a transcriptome of this leaf and this leaf, you will definitely identify large number of genes, but you will not definitely identify the genes that is responsible for providing this kind of phenotype. Because when you do phenotyping into the natural field soil condition, the uh, dehydration, cellular dehydration avoidance mechanism is the one that predominantly expresses in the soil environment where the plant employs a deep rooting system. So it takes up water from the deeper soil layer. So in this case, if you do a leaf transcriptome and identify or you try to uh, identify genes and you can make gene network, you can do many things, but you will not be able to identify the reason why the plant is tolerant. That's why it is important to understand what you are uh, doing. And if you do uh, phenotype in the pot, I am not saying that phenotyping in the pot is not important. It is very important to uh, do phenotype under different conditions to identify genes that are responsible for different mechanism of stress tolerance. So if you do a phenotyping under the pot condition, you can see that within three days you face uh, extreme stresses. In this, you can find some genotype which are tolerant, some which are sensitive. So under this condition, if you identify, uh, do uh, any uh, work and identify genes, this will be mainly responsible for the uh, cellular dehydration tolerance genes. That is even when the cell water uh, relations are uh, poor, the plant is able to survive. But in this condition also, when, when you compare across the studies, Uh, like from one place to one place, if you conduct experiment there, you may face, uh, see a difference. Like here, uh, uh, this is the pots are kept in open, so within three days they dry. But if you keep uh, the pots in a greenhouse where the relative humidity is normally high, where we uh, do experiment, the lab experiment uh, mostly in greenhouses where the relative humidity is high, when the relative humidity is high, the vapor pressure deposit in the air is less. So the vapor pressure deficit is the one that drives the transpiration. So when you, uh, the transpiration determines how much amount of water the plant is going to use besides the leaf area. So that's why there is 
like within three days these plants uh, reached almost a drying stage, but these plants are still alive. So here two factors are important. When you compare the genotype, you should see what is the leaf area produced by the genotype when we are doing a pot experiment. So if a genotype is producing large amount of leaf area, you cannot compare that genotype with the genotype which is producing less leaf area. But if you see the literature, you can find uh, several examples wherein uh, two plants are compared through a transgenic versus wild type, where the transgenic plant is initially it is small. So when it is initially small, when you uh, subject to stress, this plant is going to use less water, even if it is not tolerant. It will have a lot of moisture reserved in the pot, which can be used in the latter stages. So that's why it is critical to see whether uh, the leaf area is same when you compare the genotype and uh, the vapor pressure deficit is similar. So that's why you have to do uh, phenotyping under different conditions to identify genes for either uh, the tolerance versus avoidance mechanism. You need uh, both the mechanism for uh, to produce a better stress tolerance plant. Often uh, this, if you see these two uh, genotype here, uh, uh, this genotype, if you see the leaves, they are almost fully turgid when compared to these plants, they are almost experiencing the stress. But if we look closer, many of uh, these panicle, they, they are uh, white. That is this genotype, although the, they diff better perform better for the vegetative stage stress tolerance, that is this genotype can maintain the leaf water status better, but the reproductive failure is more. That is, uh, it is highly sensitive even for the mild amount of stress. So when you uh, analyze the uh, tolerance, you have to analyze the stage ways. That is, some genotype may be tolerant at seedling stage, or some genotype may have tolerance at vegetative stage, but for the reproductive stage, they may or may not be tolerant. So you have to identify genes that works at different tissue level and different uh, growth stage level so that you will have uh, genes that are useful for the uh, genome editing. Uh, so here, uh, some examples are given, uh, like if you see in the literature, uh, in many paper you find that the, we conducted the experiment and uh, the soil moisture, either often it is not given, it will say 15 days water was withhold. So it does not uh, say anything about the stress, only you know that the water was not uh, given for 15 days. And some people give uh, soil moisture content. So that is also no, not sufficient to understand whether stress was there or not there. Here I have given some example to illustrate that. So this is uh, the plants, two genotypes, uh, rice genotype, Nagina 22, which is a known drought tolerant genotype, and IR64, which is a drought sensitive genotype. These are grown in one experiment where uh, uh, it says the soil moisture content, it says it is about 25 percent. Uh, still, there is a lot of difference. This plant also experiences stress. That is, relative water content, if it is about 90 or uh, more than 90, uh, there is no stress. But as it decreases below 70, it is a stress where uh, the incipient plasma lysis takes place and the turgidity loss takes place. So here you can see both the genotype experiences stress, but this genotype perform better than this genotype. Another person is also reporting, uh, he reported that uh, the experiment was conducted, the soil moisture uh, condition was only 20 percent, but still there is no difference. You expect that dif this difference is more and the relative water content also should be, it will be still less when compared to this. So can anyone say why these differences are there? So this is very good. This is because of the different kind of soil. So if you use uh, maybe uh, sandy loam soil, uh, the water, uh, available water will be ranging from maybe 7, 8 percent to about 20 percent. If you use clay soil, maybe the available water uh, start from 20 percent of the soil moisture to about 50 percent of the soil moisture. The soil, each soil particle, I think most of those who are from agriculture uh, might have studied in their undergraduation. Each soil has different kind of soil particle and the soil particle binds to the water. So depending upon the soil matrix, water binds to the soil particle and the soil matrix potential varies. Matrix potential means the extent to which 
the water is bound to the soil. If it is strongly bound, even though the moisture is there, but it will not be able to uh, uh, reach the root or the root will not be extract that soil moisture. So, it is important to measure uh, what is the uh, kind of soil you are using and if possible, if we can express the uh, soil water status in terms of uh, soil matric potential, which is will be very useful for uh, comparing the genotype or comparing the experiment. So, this is a clay soil which has high water holding capacity at the same time the permanent melting point of uh, this clay soil is about maybe about 20, 25 percent. Whereas, uh, in case of sandy loam soil even the field capacity will be about 20 percent. So, which means the maximum available water here it is at 20, but here the minimum available water is 25 that is why we see a lot of uh, difference in this. So, better when we do experiment, when we uh, measure uh, the express soil water status in terms of uh, metric potential. So, these are uh, some uh, examples how to you measure the metric potential versus uh, the water content. And often uh, in many uh, papers, I also uh, find the soil moisture content is uh, like expression of soil moisture content is also not correctly expressed. That also is it. Remember, it is expressed per unit dry weight. Normally, if you want to know the water content, let's see what, what, how will you calculate water content? So, in a fruit, if you want to say express water content, how normally we express? Fresh weight minus dry weight divided by? So, total weight, that is what normally we do, fresh weight minus dry weight divided by the total weight. But in case of soil, it is fresh weight minus dry weight divided by dry weight. So, to compare among different soil, we use that expression. So, that is also will make lot of difference if we use the uh, weight of the soil per se. It will be different because of the um, particle nature of clay soil will be different and uh, the uh, particle nature of sandy loam soil will be different. So, the weight will be different. That is why we use on a uh, dry weight basis. So, this most of you might be knowing. So, when you give irrigation like uh, when you study some paper, they say uh, the control plants were given uh, 20 irrigation and uh, stressed plants were given 5 irrigation and still the stressed plant performed better. So, in some cases the plants may not require too much water. Say if you take uh, wheat, we give only 5 irrigation. So, it, uh, it also important like what crop you are dealing, dealing with. So, maybe control plant you irrigated uh, daily so much, it experienced already stress, hypoxia or anoxia stress. That is why control plant is not performing better, but uh, the other uh, stress plant you give water which is uh, just sufficient to maintain uh, the water in the field capacity or above 70 percent of the field capacity. That is why the plants performed under those soil moisture condition. So, is it understand the soil characteristic? and uh, what is the field capacity of the soil and what is the permanent wilting uh, capacity and based on that you have to maintain irrigation to provide a proper stress. And it is also important uh, uh, to understand how to express uh, the results when you get uh, in the stress versus uh, control plant, especially when we are uh, working with drought stress. So, here it is another example is there here uh, they studied uh, uh, the proline accumulation. Proline, you know, most of you might have studied. So, what is proline? So, it is an amino acid, essential amino acid, but it is also an osmolite. So, it accumulates under many stress conditions and often we measure proline accumulation and we say if it is accumulating high proline, it may have important role in stress protection or osmotic adjustment. So, here uh, the person exam measured uh, the prolate content and he also studied the expression uh, profiling of the genes involved in uh, the proline bias in this say delta phi pyrrolin C carboxylase expression he studied. And uh, in the proline content, he did not uh, see any difference in the between the genotypes. So, both the genotypes accumulated this is under drought stress. So, about uh, uh, 17, 18 microgram per gram fresh weight of the leaf. But uh, the uh, expression of genes for uh, proline biosynthesis was higher in Nagina 22 and uh, uh, there was no difference in the genes that is coding for the proline catabolism. 
So, uh, there was a difficulty in explaining the results. So, what could be the possibilities? Why it happens? Assume that the uh, gene is expressed and it is the expression is proportional to the activity. So, what is the problem with this drop? Is there any problem? No, what I am saying is uh, one assumption is that your expression is directly proportional to concentration. So, there is some problem with this drop. Can anyone say what is the problem with this drop? Maybe there is some problem with the accumulation. Means the protein uh, it is getting synthesized. Hmm. After you remember this is this experiment is from the like that experiment. Maybe you can assume that from this experiment the sample was taken. So, what is the problem with this drop? Is there any problem? Uh, that is uh, the reason. So, when you express on the press weight basis, you see when you impose water stress or salt stress, the leaf water content varies. That is the relative leaf water content will be different in different uh, genotype. If between control and the stress, there will be different. So, if there is a difference in the relative water content, which means when you take 100 mg of uh, uh, this one tissue, in this you may have about uh, uh, 70 uh, uh, like mg of uh, uh, water and here you may have about 50 mg of water. So, only rest only is the actual cells you are taking. So, there is a difference in the amount of tissue taken per se, but if you see often in, a, uh, in many cases we report uh, the uh, any metabolite we measure and report per gram fresh weight. So, but if you express uh, the RWC is different is there and when you express based on the dry weight of the tissue that is actual amount of tissue you take you see there is a clear difference in the tissue. So, it is important when you measure metabolites you use uh, express on dry weight basis especially when you are doing experiment with salinity stress or salt stress. So, this is to uh, why this phenotyping so much important uh, critically imposing stress is important growing plant, plant at similar condition is critically important this is illustrated by this example. So, this is two uh, transcriptome uh, study one is uh, in Arabidopsis they examined uh, the cold induced transcriptome uh, the cold uh, stress may be one of the simplest uh, stress to impose uh, in this particular paper. Uh, when they imposed cold stress about uh, uh, 900 genes were differentially expressed. In another study also they uh, did an experiment where the Arabidopsis plants were exposed to cold stress and they also found about 800 plant 800 genes they are differentially expressed. So, if you uh, see these two experiment independently uh, you will see that the amount or number of genes that are differentially expressed under cold stress is about 800 to 900. So, which is okay, you uh, it looks highly consistent, but when you compare uh, the actual genes like what are the genes upregulated or downregulated here and what are the genes upregulated and downregulated here, only you find about 242 genes that are common between these two studies, although the experiment they described it is same. So, which means that uh, the uh, the way the plants were grown or the rate at which the temperature was decreased in this experiment these minor details normally uh, we do not give in the experimental protocol. So, only about 30 percent of the genes which we identified as cold responsive or actually cold responsive rest of the 60 percent or say 65 percent of the genes which we identified they are nothing to do with the cold stress. So, that is why it is very critical when we do experiment to conduct a proper experiment. In the temperature stress experiment also often uh, we uh, ignore an important factor. So, this is an experiment which was uh, uh, say a hypothetical experiment I have given. So, the heat shock protein expression is say strongly associated with the tolerance of the genotype. So, this is uh, 
a genotype uh, in, of wheat which is highly tolerant to heat stress. This is another genotype which is sensitive to high temperature stress. So, when uh, the uh, experiment was conducted and uh, the HSP expression was studied, so under the stress condition they found that uh, the expression of uh, uh, HSP was strongly induced uh, in HG2329, but not in case of 3765. But although we know that in this HSP is very important for uh, stress tolerance, it is only an example of HSP, it may be any genes. When we uh, subject the plant to high temperature and we study the gene expression. So, uh, uh, actually this genotype is stress tolerant, it should have expressed more HSP when compared to this genotype. So, but it did not happen. So, what, uh, what could be the possible reason or why is there any problem with this experiment? They have grown the genotype and then just put this plant in the greenhouse condition and exactly given the temperature. So, is there any problem with this kind of experiment? You grow the plant and uh, keep the plant in uh, either in the temperature controlled greenhouse or in the um, uh, say uh, 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 growth chamber and then you collect the tissue and do the uh, differential expression study or transcriptome study. So, whether it will give a real uh, picture of the uh, genes that are actually involved in the uh, stress tolerance or not. So, any uh, points on this? I said this uh, experiment or they, they measured the uh, temperature of the um, growth chamber, it was perfectly, it was all right in control and stress, but uh, uh, it was the results was confusing. It is only for one, not only one gene, for several genes you find the same results. So, what could be the uh, possible thing they missed to measure? So, uh, one of the simplest thing uh, they missed to measure is the temperature of the tissue. So, when you subject uh, these uh, plants to high temperature stress, we assume that the plant experienced high, high temperature stress. So, this is the genotypic variation if you see, when you subject this plant to say for example, some X temperature, some plants will have a temperature which is about near to the ambient temperature and some plants will have a temperature which is very low when compared to the ambient temperature. So, this genotype has a 6 degree temperature, tissue temperature which is lower than that of the ambient temperature. This genotype is having the temperature almost similar to that of the ambient temperature. Similarly, you can find variation in any crop you take, the plants have an ability to cool their can canopies by transpiration process. So, uh, if the transpiration process per se are different between the genotype or the available soil moisture in the pot, if it is different between this genotype, they will affect transpiration and they can alter the canopy temperature. So, whenever we do uh, experiment, especially for gene expression studies, we should really see what is the temperature of the canopy rather than seeing the temperature of the chamber. So, we will identify like just if you use this as a criteria, maybe if we have not known that this is tolerant, this is sensitive, maybe we will identify these kind of uh, differences there. So, we may think that this genotype is better or uh, we identify some genes which are uh, not relevant to high temperature stress that are expressed in this, that are not expressed in this and then we consider it as important gene for stress tolerance. So, when you do canopy temperature, it is always important to measure the tissue temperature and if it is similar tissue temperature, if it is there, then you uh, compare the transcriptome of those plants, then you will see really the genes that are actually working under that uh, temperature condition. So, you can see lot of variation between the tissue, it is uh, uh, like panicle versus uh, leaf temperature is given. So, there will be lot of variation within the plant. So, you have to uh, critically measure this tissue and compare their temperature. Similarly, for any kind of uh, stress, yes, please. Yes. 
So, uh, you this one uh, if the thermal imaging is not available, you can use a th infrared thermometer which are very cheap. You can get uh, uh, one infrared uh, thermal gun costing less than about uh, uh, 15,000. So, some measure because we will be doing a transcrotum experiment which is costling, costing several lakhs. So, when we come back to that, uh, these equipments are uh, cheaper and also uh, uh, we have to take utmost precaution to provide same amount of uh, soil moisture and uh, the plants are uh, pretty uniform and then you expose the stress and also measure the temperature of the plant, plant tissue before taking the sample. So, uh, the infrared thermo, uh, thermometer is a cheaper one, you can use that one. Only when you use infrared thermometer, uh, there is a problem of uh, the field of view. So, if infrared thermometer can measure like if you focus like this, but our object is there and the front, it will measure the temperature. So, each uh, infrared thermometer will have a field of view. So, it may be smaller or larger depending upon the instrument and also from the distance from which you are measuring. So, try to see that the field of view is covering the plant tissue, not the pot or soil and other parts of the area. Yes. In single transcriptome analysis, we cannot conclude that this gene is expressing during stress time. It should be throughout stress period. No, uh, see, uh, all the genes they have a different expression. Kinetics, like some genes will be expressing early, some genes will be expressing late, and some gene expression will be sustained, and some may be like decreasing. Gene expression is highly depend on environment and tissue specific. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. It's expressing throughout the stress period or initial single stress period in single transcriptome analysis in each stage we cannot conclude. So, that That's is true. We, we have to uh, for any gene expression analysis to know whether it is important or not at single time point or single tissue will not be sufficient. Okay. We have to do at multiple if any gene expression it is having a kinetics like it will start expressing and it will reach high and then. Uh, still, uh, the uh, even though if the gene may be required uh, to function at uh, uh, further hours, the since it has sufficient protein, till the half life of the protein uh, is as long as the half life of protein is longer, maybe that gene is shut down for some time, and once the protein is less, again it will be induced. So we have to do all this analysis at multiple time points. That's why it is very difficult to identify genes based on the transcriptome analysis or just gene expression analysis. Uh, better, uh, most of the genes identified <coughs> through other approaches uh, are better, like based on the uh, uh, genotypic differences or uh, the uh, um, mutants, if you identify genes that are more uh, easy to associate with the phenotype. Otherwise, you will identify several and you have to validate uh, their function. So, I think uh, uh, next we will uh, go to the mechanism. I thought uh, instead of putting mechanism for each stress, I will give a uh, general idea. Then most of you might have studied uh, stress a lot in your studies. So, when uh, stress is there, so uh, the mechanism of uh, uh, stress tolerance or uh, uh, the yield protection uh, under stress can be put it as stress escape. So, this was already exploited in plant breeding or by crop management. Stress is there here, stress for example, I have shown that here uh, instead of plant, I have put a uh, like iron beam and it is placed on two pillars. So, assume that if uh, the stress or the weight is falling on this iron beam, the iron beam is going to bend or break. So, similarly, if the plant experiences stress, it is going to give less yield or it is going to die. So, if the stress or if the weight is not falling on the iron beam, then there is no harm to the uh, this iron beam. Similarly, if the stress is not occurring in the phase where the plant is grown, then there is no problem for the plant. So, if you want to uh, grow a crop in the current season, if it can mature in Delhi, say if it is in 60 days, if it can mature, if you do uh, sowing in July, uh, by August and you will harvest. So, you know in uh, Delhi you have rain for two months, so the plant may not experience stress. 
or uh, you uh, do it in the uh, stored soil moisture condition like uh, in the winter, you do a short duration crop, maybe the soil moisture is sufficient to meet the requirement of the crop. So, most earlier uh, stage, of, uh, stage of plant breeding were focused on this one, they try to match the season and the rainfall pattern with the crop and they try to develop uh, short duration varieties because of that the yield was stabilized. But this is often uh, not sufficient mechanism or there is no mechanism, uh, biological mechanism is involved here. Actual biological mechanisms, uh, when the uh, actual the plant faces the stress, what happens? That is the actual biological mechanisms which we are interested in. Say for example, if the weight is falling on the beam, so uh, it can have uh, different uh, uh, responses. So, uh, instead of two beam, so if there is a three beams are there and the weight is falling on the on this particular place. So, it may not have that much impact. If the weight is falling on this beam, so because there is no support from the bottom, so it may have some bending or uh, breakage. But if it is weight is falling on this or here or you have wherever some support is there, it will not have any effect. So, these kind of mechanisms are also exist in plant where the uh, say for example, a plant is having a deep root system. So, when there is no rain, it can take up more moisture from the deeper layer of the soil. So, it will not experience the stress or uh, it, it has higher transpiration. So, when you subject them to high temperature stress, they may not actually experience the tissue temperature or in case of salinity stress, it has ability to put all the salts into vacuole or it can, it can secrete in the uh, secretory glands. So, they may not face this stress. These are some of the avoidance mechanism, constitutive avoidance mechanism. Some of these may also be induced, like in some cases, uh, the plants may have deeper root constitutively, that is by birth, they have that character. Sometimes when there is a mild stress starts, the plant senses that stress and then they can grow the root deeper. So, these kind of cellular mechanism are very important. These are called as uh, stress, cellular stress postponement or avoidance mechanism. That is, there is a environmental stress is there, but the plant is postponing the uh, stress in the tissue by using mechanism that helps in postponement or avoidance. So, when uh, the this mechanism, first all the plants they try to use this mechanism and when this mechanism uh, is facing the limitation, then uh, the cells experience stress. So, the plants have several stress tolerance uh, mechanisms. So, once uh, even though there is some impact that is visually you can see the iron beam is bent. So, similarly the plant may be, uh, it might have reduced stature or some of the leaves are dried because of the stress. But if it has cellular stress tolerance, it can have better recovery. That is, uh, some of the responses are elastic. That is, under stress condition, uh, the um, process is almost uh, broken down. But when the stress is relieved, these processes are recovered to its original states. Some of the uh, mechanisms, they are plastic. Although they will recover to certain extent, but still it will be less than that of the normal plant. So, these recovery mechanisms and uh, the cellular stress tolerance mechanisms are very important for improving the stress response. So, for each of the stress, uh, if you think you can identify various mechanisms that have been identified, you have to put into these categories and see in the target population of environment what kind of uh, mechanism operate and based on that you can uh, select genes for uh, genome editing. So, uh, so far we talked a lot about environment and uh, we uh, also uh, should know what is the mechanism of uh, uh, stress tolerance and what are the genes involved. So, again uh, this is a very vast uh, topic uh, uh, for each stress to discuss what are the genes involved. So, any stress is that it is going to produce some signal, how the plant will know it has to have some physical, chemical or electrical or some redox signal, some signal should be there from the stress. So, if water is not there, a plant get what signal? Signal is what? It is a wilting is a response. What is the signal? Hmm? Closing of stomata is a uh, response. Uh, ABA is okay, it is a secondary signal. 
So, immediate uh, it will it one is like when the water is not there, water evaporates from the cell, cell is uh, like you know uh, plasma membrane is there, cell wall is there, when it is having water, fully water, the plasma membrane is oppressed with the uh, cell wall, it is turgid. So, when water is not there, water is evaporating from the cell and it is not getting water from the root, so it shrinks. So, that is the turgidity loss or the uh, the osmotic uh, 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 potential change is the immediate physical stress uh, the plant feels. So, that can induce some signal that is membrane is detaching from the um, cell wall. So, some of the wall, uh, wall associated or membrane associated protein can initiate cellular process or because of less water available there is a change in metabolism say uh, if water is not there uh, like as you said the stomata closes but still light is coming, um, the cell is having the same amount of light. So, it will produce lot of uh, uh, electrons that will lead to production of uh, superoxide and other radical or uh, say uh, the uh, Calvin cycle is stopped. So, the metabolism is affected, so many metabolites can be produced. So, large number of signals can be there, it may be primary signal or uh, uh, other kind of signals can be there. So, there are uh, sensors and uh, uh, we have maybe very less uh, sensors that directly sense the primary signals per se. So, still lot work needs to be done how the uh, plant senses various kind of stresses. So, once they sense uh, often uh, it can produce some sensor, it may be uh, the membrane bound or it may be uh, intracellular, it produces some second messengers and the second messengers uh, do the signal transduction which you might have studied a large and also it can produce secondary signals. Secondary signals are like ABA is not a um, uh, like direct signal of the stress, it is a secondary signal. Once uh, the stress is there, the plant produces this secondary signal to amplify the signal transduction. That is either the uh, inactive ABA is activated by beta glucosidase or the ABA synthesis is promoted and actual ABA amount of ABA accumulate and these kind of secondary signals can be produced which will amplify the signal and these signals can be mobile from one tissue to other. Like for example, if root faces stress, it produces ABA and it send it to the leaf to close the stomata. So, these are uh, kind of, yes? Electrical signal, uh, electrical, uh, signal it is produced in all kind of stresses. So, only uh, uh, like when, uh, what is electrical signal? So, the membrane potential is often minus 150 uh, millivolts something, it is membrane potential. So, any stress that affect the master enzyme what we call as the uh, proton ATPase which is present on the plasma membrane. If any stress that affect the ATPase activity, it is going to alter the membrane potential. Or if uh, some uh, ionic stress is there, some uh, outside it is like uh, uh, some ions are there which is uh, taken inside and it if, if it is reducing the membrane potential, the potential difference between the membrane that can cause electrical signal. So, this one has been studied uh, um, like often uh, people have studied, but so far uh, it has also been demonstrated that plant when you give a stress to the plant, it produces an electrical signal. So, if you uh, take um, let us say for example, if you take a wheat plant, this is uh, one of the studies uh, uh, conducted long back in the our uh, division under uh, the guidance of Professor uh, later Professor S. K. Sina. So, what uh, they have done is they have taken the wheat plant, wheat plant has a fibrous root system. So, you take the wheat plant and uh, uh, half of the uh, uh, root you put it in normal water, half of the leaf you put it in the uh, stress condition that is you can use PEG or something. So, when you uh, measure uh, the uh, like they measured the uh, electric potential when compared to the entire root system is in the uh, normal condition and half of the root system is in the PEG or the entire root system is in the PEG. So, when the half of the root system is in the PEG, the plant still it should the those amount of roots are sufficient for taking the water. Like if you remove half of the roots, if you cut rest of the root, then also the plant will not experience the stress. But if when these roots are some roots are subjected to stress, they found that there is a difference in the electrical potential of the leaf changes 
and then this lead to stomatal closure. So this uh, has been studied, uh, like several people have reported this, but still we do not understand like how it is propagated and these mechanisms are being studied. So uh, once the uh, signal transduction is there, you get alteration in the protein stability or activity and then that can directly like causes any physiological process, a protein is inhibited or activated, it can change its activity or it alters the gene expression and ultimately you see lot of changes, you get the quality and yield changes. So we have maybe several thousand genes so far known for all these things in maybe several crops. But our uh, difficulty is uh, to uh, uh, pinpoint which gene uh, we have to select for editing and uh, how much impact it is going to have. So if we can select either uh, the positive regulators or uh, negative regulators for uh, editing the uh, genome. So if you are uh, using uh, different approaches, like if you are using positive regulator, then we need to enhance the expression or if you are using the negative regulator, we have to down regulate the expression. So now we will see some examples of uh, uh, genome editing. This you have listened uh, for the last uh, several days, so I need not uh, put much emphasis on what is genome editing. I will directly give some example. So this is one example wherein a positive regulator is upregulated by using a genome editing uh, technology. So the uh, Argos 8 is a negative regulator of ethylene signaling. So ethylene is one of the classical plant hormone which is induced under several stress condition and uh, development. And if ethylene is induced, it will affect the, reduce the root growth and it will uh, induce the cell death process. So if we can uh, suppress the ethylene signaling, several evidences they have shown that uh, we can promote the stress tolerance of the plant. So in this case, uh, uh, the Argos 8 uh, gene was selected for this purpose. This is a negative regulator of ethylene signaling. And earlier uh, study, they showed that when you do the Argos 8 overexpression uh, in the maize and Arabidopsis, and the maize plants were tested in the field condition, and they found that this gene can enhance the yield of the maize without causing the yield penalty under normal conditions. So when you select a gene for uh, uh, improving the stress tolerance, you should see that this gene overexpression or knockout, it should not compromise the yield under normal condition, but it should cause the yield stability or yield for better performance under the stress condition. So often uh, in the farmer's field, uh, you may or may not get a stress in some cases, like if it is uh, drought, if it is rainfall dependent area, you may get good rainfall here and bad rainfall here. But for salinity, you know that there is going to be a stress. So depending upon the stress, you see that uh, the performance is uh, better under or equal under normal condition and only under the stress condition, uh, the gene um, gives the phenotype. So in this case, they have selected this Argos 8. Uh, the Argos 8 uh, gene expresses uh, in the uh, this is initially they studied in Arabidopsis, the expression uh, level is uh, uh, less. And when, uh, so that's why they want to enhance the expression of this uh, Argos 8 gene constitutively so that the high level of Argos 8 can uh, regulate ethylene signaling and it can uh, uh, inhibit the ethylene uh, pathway so that it can produce better performance under stress condition. So for that they needed a promoter which is not very strong, otherwise the entire ethylene signaling may be inhibited. So they selected a promoter, uh, this study was conducted in maize, they selected a GOS2 gene promoter which has moderate expression. So what was done was in this, uh, they used uh, homology dependent uh, repair pathway uh, for editing uh, this, uh, uh, this Argos uh, uh, 8 gene that is to enhance the expression of Argos 8. So the native promoter is weak, so expression is not very high. So they used the GOS2 promoter from the maize only. So the same plant they took a promoter region from uh, the GOS2 gene and use two different guide RNAs uh, like uh, one guide RNA or they used uh, two different guide RNA to replace the Argos 8 promoter or they used one guide RNA to insert this GOS2 promoter in the uh, 5 prime UTR of the Argos 8 gene. 
So, in this uh, they use homology uh, of about between the after the promoter the flanking region per about 400 base per homology was used which is homologous to this region and this region and by using uh, the homology dependent repair pathway they could uh, develop both the kind of plant that is uh, GAS2 promoter is inserted in the 5 prime UTR uh, in the beginning of the 5 prime UTR and then uh, it can drive the gene expression or they replace the Argos 8 promoter with the uh, GAS2 promoter. So, both are from the maize. So, it is a kind of promoter replacement uh, within the plant, a cisgenic approach you can say. And uh, they found uh, the expression of uh, these plant, uh, the, uh, uh, the, when the promoter was replaced, they found that the expression was higher when compared to the, uh, uh, the wild type plant or it is uh, only uh, inserted in the uh, UTR region. And they compared the yield performance of uh, these maize plant under the field condition. So, when the flowering stage uh, stress was there, uh, they found uh, there is a 6 bushel per acre uh, difference was there which was statistically significant although there was uh, uh, under the grain filling stage stress there is no statistically uh, significant difference or under the optimum condition also uh, you find the uh, difference is not statistically si significant. So, you can do this kind of approach that is you uh, modify the promoter uh, to regulate the expression of a positive regulator and then it is possible to enhance the yield. So, in this case they selected a promoter which is uh, which is having a moderate expression and then they put it. So, it, it depends like promoter editing is uh, really uh, very good, uh, it, it can be used uh, in a wise way in, uh, in especially in the uh, plants because when you knock out the gene, we do not know why the nature has selected the gene, it might have some function. So, unless otherwise we are not very clear uh, the knockout will may have some impact. So, you need lot of studies to see the gene is really not important. So, otherwise if the promoter editing is uh, very good because this gene if you study uh, many of the stress responsive gene they express in some tissue it is highly induced, in some tissue it is not induced. So, uh, uh, you can uh, identify the promoter elements that specifically drives the stress responsive expression, you can leave the constitutive expression like if you delete uh, say A, B, R, E binding element in a drought responsive gene, only the drought responsive expression will be reduced, otherwise the rest of the uh, expression still the, the cis elements are intact. So, the regulation by other pathway developmental pathway they will be still it will be working. So, uh, that is that's why we need lot of understanding about uh, the promoter. It was shown uh, for the uh, bacterial blight resistance in rice, the sweet genes, they are uh, the sucrose transporters. So, those are also essential for uh, the plant function. What they have done is they have edited uh, the tail binding sites in the rice. So, that paper I have not put it, but somebody will. Uh, discuss when they discuss the disease uh, resistance or you might have read, it, uh, read uh, that paper. So, wherein uh, the tails they bind to the sweet genes and they induce the expression when the infection is there, lot of sugar is exported to the apoplast, so the bacteria can grow better. So, uh, what they have done is they identified the tail binding sites, it is known, so mutated only thus that cis element. So, the rest of the expression is maintained normal, only when the bacteria infects the expression is not getting upregulated. So, if you have understanding uh, of the gene, then uh, then only we can go for uh, what to do it. So, so this one is uh, the another uh, kind of uh, uh, examples available. There are several examples available uh, in uh, uh, stress tolerance. Many many of these examples are like when you uh, knock out the positive regulator they give susceptibility. So, I did not take many of those example, only one I have taken uh, for that purpose. And uh, other most of the uh, other examples are when you do uh, CRISPR genome editing, you find the phenotype or you get alleles which are uh, 
it's a totally novel function or totally different function. So the cytokine, in, you know, it is very important hormone. It is anti senescence hormone. Uh, it is important for stress. Cells should maintain certain amount of cytokine. If it too much cytokine, in, then it is plant is sensitive. If it is too less, the plant is not growing. It is going to die. So some amount of cytokine in is important. Uh, the uh, one of the uh, group of enzymes that are important for cytokine in biosynthesis is the uh, lone ligand enzyme, which is downstream of the isopentanyl transferase. Most of the studies have been conducted with overexpression of this gene. So what these people have done is they screened uh, uh, almost uh, uh, two lakh activation tag uh, lines of rice. They identified a drought tolerant plant. And when they uh, uh, did the flanking sequence analysis, they found that uh, a tDNA insertion was there in the three prime end of the uh, this lonely uh, guy like uh, five gene in uh, rice. So the mutation was at most at the end of the uh, coding sequence. And uh, but this plant was tolerant to drought stress, so they want to use genome editing. Uh, to create some allele and study their uh, stress response. So they uh, targeted uh, a region which is uh, um, marked here around 225 to uh, the latter portion of the region was targeted by using three different uh, 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 guide RNAs. And these are the kind of uh, mutants they uh, obtained. These are the nucleotide sequence comparison though they grouped depending upon the uh, nucleotide deleted different kind of edit they grouped. And this is the kind of protein change. If there is single base pair, a single base pair or two base pair deletion, and you know there is a frame shift and uh, different kind of uh, uh, proteins forms after this. Up to this, the protein is same as that of uh, lonely guy 5. Then after that, there is a difference in the sequence between the wild type and different editor lines. So you can, uh, by create, doing this mutation, you create large amount of allelic variation. So you can consider each of them as a different kind of allele. And the interesting result was when they analyzed uh, the stress response, um, uh, you can see uh, they analyzed for the two stresses. One is the nitrogen deficiency stress, and another one is drought stress. When this particular gene was overexpressed, that is, this is constitutive overexpression by using a transgenic approach, uh, actually the yield uh, decreased in both normal nitrogen condition as well as uh, the uh, stress condition. And these values are significant differences. If it is less than 0 0.05, you think that it is, the difference is significant from the control. Some of the edits uh, here, you can say that these edits, edit B, edit C, they had better uh, grain yield under uh, the uh, normal nitrogen condition as well as under the stress condition also they produced a better yield. Similarly, under the drought uh, stress condition, uh, these edits, uh, these are experiment conducted in the field in uh, two different uh, um, uh, like uh, uh, places in China. And here also they found that some edits they performed better under stress condition. This in one experiment they have got about 26% uh, to 27% yield advantage in some of the edits, whereas other edits they are not uh, providing that much tolerance. So uh, this not only it helps in producing uh, this approach, uh, CRISPR approach helps in producing the stress tolerant uh, plant, but it also helps to uh, engineer a lot of alleles which are uh, uh, maybe naturally present which we may not know and then to understand the function of the that particular gene. Uh, the uh, other example, some examples I will give from the abscisic acid uh, signaling pathway. So abscisic acid is uh, one of the plant hormone which is uh, studied almost uh, from 1960s, large number of people have worked on this. And it is it having several roles from the stromatal closure to normal vegetative growth and the seed development and seed dormancy and uh, the root promotion, extreme stress tolerance. This under abiotic stress, it, it is almost having a promoting role. And for normal vegetative growth, it needs certain levels of ABA. If ABA is high, then also growth is less. This is a ABA1 mutant where ABA is less. If ABA is less, then also growth is less. And for uh, seed development and dormancy, ABA is important. If ABA is not there, the seed is going to germinate on the mother plant. So we will have great difficulty in agriculture. 
But in case of uh, biotic stress response, there are uh, like uh, the responses are uh, different with different kind of uh, uh, pathogen. So this is um, uh, with uh, uh, for uh, this rice brown spot disease, the ABA is a positive regulator. For some of the other diseases, it has been shown as a negative regulator. So it has a dual role. So when you work with the ABA pathway, you have to see how to balance between the biotic and the abiotic stresses. And the ABA is also uh, important uh, nutraceutical because this is not only a plant hormone, it is also uh, an important hormone in uh, 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 human beings where uh, uh, it controls from immune, innate immunity to uh, the insulin response in human beings. So that is, it is a pro survival factor in plants also. So the ABA signaling uh, pathway, at least the core pathway is well established now. So you know what are the positive and uh, negative regulators. So the receptor, at least one set of receptor, they are soluble receptor. They are present in the, uh, uh, the uh, intracellular uh, space, that is in the cytosol. And when ABA is not there, the receptor is alone. It is not interacting with any of the other protein. So when the ABA is not there, uh, the protein phosphatase 2C and the clay DA group of protein, there are about 9 to 10 uh, genes are there in uh, different plants. And these proteins, they interact with the SNRK, that is SNF1 related uh, protein kinases. These are serine protein kinases and two different families, SNRK1 and SNRK2 family proteins, they interact with this protein phosphatase 2C. So this protein phosphatase 2C bind to this kinases and it is not allowing the um, function of the kinase, it de continuously depospyrylate these kinases. So these kinases are autopospyrylated and then these kinases transfer the phosphate group to or it phosphorylate it uh, targets. So that is important for inducing the activity. So this SNRK1 family kinase, they are involved in the energy signaling, whereas the, uh, the SNRK2 kinases, they are involved in the uh, stress response. So when there is a stress, uh, ABA accumulation uh, increases, and this ABA now it binds to the uh, receptor. Once the receptor, uh, uh, the ABA binds to the receptor, the configuration of the receptor changes, it produces a uh, uh, better configuration, which can interact with protein phosphatase 2C. So now uh, the protein phosphatase 2C is sequestered by uh, its interaction with the ABA receptor. So now the kinase is uh, free. So these kinases then can phosphorylate variety of uh, transcription factor or uh, the, these are uh, some of the ion channels or uh, the aquaporins. So many membrane proteins can be phosphorylated and some of the phosphorylation can inhibit the activity, some of the phosphorylation can activate the activity of protein and thus you get the uh, stress uh, response. So in this, uh, uh, some of the negative regulators uh, are the protein phosphatase 2C, A is the major negative regulator. And in addition to that, uh, it was reported about 20 years back, uh, the farnesyl transferases, they negatively regulate uh, the signaling, but uh, we don't know exactly where they work. But these are a group of protein uh, which uh, work as negative regulator. So these two uh, are the important negative negative regulator of uh, the stress signaling. So either you can modulate uh, the uh, receptors or uh, the positive regulators, that is the target, the transcription factor, or you regulate uh, this negative regulator for improving the stress tolerance. So uh, when you uh, want to uh, Target the positive regulator, either you can enhance the expression by, as I told earlier, uh, they used the promoter replacement approach to enhance the expression. Alternatively, the other approaches can be uh, URF editing, that is upstream U, uh, URF regions are there in often about uh, uh, almost 30 to 50 percent of the genes goaded by uh, different organisms, they have upstream URF, which is a short uh, uh, protein coding region. So that often uh, hinders the uh, translation process, so uh, the protein produced from the transcript is less. So either you can modify that, or you can uh, modify the promoter, or you can modify the epigenome or, uh, uh, in that particular region so that expression is enhanced. So in this approach, they used, uh, uh, they modified the epigenome of uh, the promoter of the ABF2, which is one of the important transcription factor that regulate uh, several stress-responsive genes. So 
So, in this uh, the uh, D gas 9 was fused with uh, histone acetyl transferase which can uh, acetylate the histone 3 lysine 27 uh, residue. That is uh, uh, once it is acetylated the uh, chromatin is decontents. So, it is uh, easy for uh, the enzymes to access uh, the region for uh, transcription process. So, they used two different uh, guide RNA to guide the DGS9 uh, Cas9 and uh, uh, histone acetyl transferase to the specific location. And then they developed, initially they developed with these two guide RNAs, they developed uh, uh, transgenics and they found that in these lines the uh, expression was better. And then uh, they also uh, studied uh, their stress response and uh, stress responsive gene expression. This is one of the uh, RD29 is one of the stress responsive gene which is regulated uh, uh, by this transcription factor. So, they found that under stress condition in the transgenic the expression was high and they just uh, done a small study to see if it can enhance the stress tolerance. So, uh, with the uh, plant with guide RNA uh, they found that uh, the plants are more tolerant to dehydration stress whereas, the plant without uh, guide RNA they are not tolerant. So, this is after dehydration the plants were rewatered and the recovery was analyzed. So, this is an example just to show that this is an approach where uh, you can modify the histone acetylation to enhance the stress tolerance. But however, this will be considered as uh, transgenic approach only because this transgen is always it should be there in the plant for keep activating the expression. Uh, uh, besides this, uh, this ABA receptor family in Arabidopsis in other plants it contain large number of genes unlike other hormone receptor where few receptor there in each plant. ABA receptors one uh, particular group that is the soluble ABA receptor large number is there are more than 10 receptors we find in many plants. So, in order to uh, study their uh, function in stress and uh, in order to see that because this ABA receptors uh, from the Arab Arabidopsis studies it was known that some of the receptors were important for uh, the uh, regulation of uh, stomatal control and some are important for germination, some are important for uh, uh, like uh, both the process. So, in order to uh, study uh, these ABA receptors uh, uh, in Zhang Kang Zhu lab, they did uh, mut mutagenized all the ABA receptors by using uh, the uh, CRISPR Cas9 technology. And also, they up obtained single, double, triple, and all kind of uh, uh, mu mutants in different mutant combination, and they studied uh, their yield performance. So, this is one of the uh, studies where, uh, in if you mutagenize these ABA receptors. Uh, you find that this plants they grow better under a normal environmental condition that is uh, the growth when compared to wild type this plant growth is better and they produce higher yield. Uh, but uh, we have to see uh, identify the plants or identify the mutant combination it, it promotes the growth under a normal condition, but it should not uh, cause other problem as I told ABA is important for uh, BB Perry. So, this, this is the mutant where you can see all the seeds are already germinated uh, before harvesting. Still the leaves are green, you see all the seeds germinated here, whereas not in the wild type. So, in this kind of uh, mutant combination they analyzed and they found that uh, some of the mutant combination that is uh, file 1, file 4 and uh, file 6. When this mutant combination is there, the viviparous germination was very less. So, this is if all the genes are mutated, you get lot of viviparous germination. If only these three genes are mutated, they found uh, the viviparous germination was less. And then they also analyzed the uh, water loss uh, to see how uh, it is going to affect stress response. So, in this case, um, here if you have mutation in many genes, the plant is going to lose more water. But if you have mutation in a few genes, maybe the plant is going to lose uh, water in an intermittent way. They, they examined uh, the response of these mutants, mainly the uh, triple mutant they studied which were appear to be promising that is less compromised in the viviparous germination. They performed better and uh, they produced about 25 percent higher yield under normal environmental condition 
in two different uh, years of study. Uh, um, and they also analyzed uh, the transpiration and as expected because these plants are unable to control uh, the stomata, you find more amount of uh, coolness and they produce better transpiration. Uh, however, if you are subjecting them to any kind of water stress, these plants are going to die. So, uh, this study it shows that like these plants, although uh, the mutagenizing AB receptor can be one approach to enhance the yield under normal condition, but if there is any stress, then it is going to be a disastrous. The other uh, one it is, uh, so far people have not tried, I am putting this approach for you people. So, this one um, is uh, the Arabidops, the ABA receptor, as I told it is, um, ABA is very important for stress tolerance, but the excess at non-stress condition, it is going to be detrimental. So, uh, once the ABA receptors were identified, uh, people uh, were uh, using different approaches to improve the stress tolerance. So, one of the approach what uh, was uh, tried from maybe 1970s is that whether you can immunize the plant, that is you spray ABA to the plant before stress, the plant is ready for experiencing the stress. So, that works very well with the plant, but ABA is uh, costly and other problem is there, so that is why it is not sprayed in the field condition. So, if you can identify uh, uh, like uh, uh, naturally or uh, the chemical that is used in the uh, agriculture uh, normally and if you can spray that chemical, if you can modify the ABA receptor to bind to that particular chemical, then you can easily identify a chemical which is readily available in the market and you can just spray that which is also cheap and the ABA response can be mediated. So, this kind is possible uh, with the uh, engineering of the receptor which is called as orthogonal receptor. So, these receptors you modify the uh, native receptors, you edit uh, some of the amino acids uh, which bind to the uh, native ligand, you modify the binding packet to uh, of the receptor so that this receptor can bind to a non-native chemical, but it will not bind to the native chemical. So, what they have done is in the ABA receptor, uh, uh, one of the ABA receptor they made uh, six different amino acid edit. So, now uh, this receptor can bind to one of the fungicide which is uh, used to control the phytophthora. The mandipropamide can now bind to uh, this receptor, but this receptor cannot bind to abscisic acid. So, whenever uh, if, if it, uh, this, uh, they uh, mutagenized this receptor and then they produce a transgenic plant. So, you can also do this by homology dependent repair in non-transgenic way. So, this is a transgenic plant wherein uh, this mutations were created and when you spray this fungicide on the plant, this plant closes its stomata. You can see this one is the thermal image and uh, uh, if the stomata is closed, you can see a rise in temperatures. When they sprayed on this Arabidopsis or tomato plant, uh, it closes tomato and also it gives excellent uh, stress tolerance. The wild type plant uh, sprayed with mandipropamide before express exposing to the stress almost died, whereas these plants, transgenic plant sprayed with this mandipropamide, they uh, are tolerant. So, this is possible like we can uh, use a CRISPR approach to make these kind of edits in the receptor so that you can engineer orthogonal uh, receptor in the plant and uh, you can use the agrochemical for control. So, uh, earlier to this there are several agrochemicals or several chemicals which are not commonly used were also identified uh, for this purpose, but uh, the regulation is another issue. Like uh, like transgenic, even uh, any chemical if you want to register for agriculture use, you have to have the environmental safety, human toxicity, several tests need to be done, which is even costlier than uh, the uh, regulation of uh, GM crop. So, that is why this kind of approach people are trying. So, whatever uh, the already approved chemical is there, so if we can modify the receptor so that uh, through modified protein, you can use the native chemical for regulating the stress response. Uh, uh, the another approach from the literature uh, it was there was on the reducing uh, stomatal density. So, if you reduce the stomatal density, you expect less amount of uh, transpiration. 
So, uh, by using both uh, CPF and Cas9, a study was done in Erie and they generated mutant and they found mutant with drastically reduction in the uh, stromatal number, but uh, in this paper, uh, um, uh, the results on the stress response or the water use was not there, but it is an approach that can be used to reduce the stromatal number. So, you have to uh, see what is the critical number you should maintain. You cannot like totally shut off the stomata and then you produce any yield. So this is another approach people are trying to uh, target. So in our uh, lab, we are uh, uh, from the last year, we are also working on uh, some of these genes, uh, uh, drought and salt tolerance and the microRNA 169, protein phosphatase 2C, farnesyl transferase, CBB20. These are the stress related genes uh, we are working with. In one gene, we have uh, made some progress. In other gene, the uh, work is in progress. Some mutants have been identified in some of them, and in some of them, it is in the uh, process of development. So one of the gene which we selected was the drought and salt tolerance. Not only we are working, even many other people may be working with this gene because this gene was a popular gene which was identified in 2009, which gives tolerance to both drought and uh, salt stress. Uh, extreme drought and salt stress. This gene was identified again based on the mutant screening. So they screened about 270,000 EMS mutant to identify this particular mutant. So we also screened large number of uh, the Nagina 22 mutant, but we could not get this allele from that one. So uh, that's why we have selected uh, a genome editing approach. So this is a, um, uh, this gene, the drought and uh, salt tolerance uh, gene was identified in 2009 and this protein uh, regulates the uh, stomatal control mainly through the uh, hydrogen peroxide homeostasis. So in stomata, you know the respiratory burst oxidases are activated by ABA and other signaling and they produce uh, hydrogen peroxide and then hydrogen peroxide plays an important role in uh, stomatal uh, closure. So this gene in an ABA independent pathway, uh, it regulates a peroxidase pour. That is if the normal version of uh, this uh, transcription factor is there, it binds to peroxidase 24 uh, promoter and it induces the gene expression. And uh, if the peroxidase expression is high, it is going to use the hydrogen peroxide and the hydrogen peroxide signal will not be there. So it is a kind of negative regulator of hydrogen peroxide accumulation. So when this gene is mutated, uh, in this particular case, the DSG1 mutation was there in the, uh, uh, the uh, N69 was converted into uh, D, asparagine to aspartic acid mutation was there. That was two mutation they identified, but this mutation uh, by using the uh, molecular studies, they confirmed that this is the causal mutation for uh, the DSG mutation. So if there is a mutation in the zinc finger uh, domain, this protein is unable to bind to the DNA and then so it is not able to regulate, induce the expression. So these plants are more tolerant to drought and salt stress. Uh, besides that, the, there are several other uh, studies. They showed that this protein is an uh, important candidate. That's why we have uh, selected uh, this one. Uh, they uh, also, uh, like uh, uh, from the uh, microarray study, they found that one of the uh, kinase uh, was highly induced uh, in the uh, mutant uh, version. So based on this, uh, they, uh, 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 this one is uh, like induced by uh, DST gene when it is overexpressed. So uh, they identified uh, this particular mutant and they also validated that is the uh, kinase which is interacting or which is uh, downstream for the DST gene. When the, uh, this gene is overexpressed, then the plants are sensitive. That is if there is uh, mutation in this gene, the plants are tolerant. If there is uh, uh, overexpression of its target protein, the plant is sensitive. So it suggests that this is a good candidate. And by using yeast to habit also, they identified another one co-activator zinc finger protein, which is uh, um, called DCA. When this plant was overexpressed, then also uh, like these plants produce a sensitive phenotype to drought and salt. So by different means, it appears that if we mutate uh, DST, we may get uh, a good phenotype for stress tolerance. In addition to that, uh, the earlier study was also shown that they uh, identified uh, from the different aspect that uh, they want to know uh, uh, the 
plants which can produce higher grain number. Again, uh, EMS uh, mutant screening led to identification of uh, gene which they named it as regulator of GN1A. GN1A is uh, gene for cytokinin oxidase that control grain number. So, in this case, uh, there was a mutation here, uh, a single base insertion was there between this nucleotide which results in the frame shape mutation. So, if we see the normal DST uh, sequence versus the reg one sequence, the amino acid sequence is same up to this one, after that there is a frame shift and then the rest of the sequence got changed because of the single insertion mutation. This led to increase in the grain number. So, we thought using this will be a like uh, uh, very good approach for uh, producing both uh, stress tolerant version as well as uh, high grain number version. So, we uh, used to, uh, we uh, developed two uh, guide RNAs for targeting two different regions of uh, the DST gene. And uh, we got large number of alleles, some of them uh, deleted like deletion mutation where the entire region between uh, uh, this to this place is deleted and we got this deletion mutant. In addition to that, we have also got uh, uh, insertion mutant. Uh, whereas, uh, there is insertion here, after that you see that uh, the entire protein sequence got changed. So, you have got all kind of alleles that can be uh, analyzed for uh, the uh, stress response as well as uh, yield increase. So, uh, as uh, reported for from the EMS mutant, when there is a mutation, loss of function mutant, that is N16D, which caused, uh, made the protein um, like in a, unable to bind to the uh, cis element uh, of the target gene that gave uh, drought and salt tolerance phenotype. And that mutation also, uh, it, they have reported that the enhancement in the uh, leaf weight and reduction in the number of stomata for the plant. So, in the deletion mutant which we generated also, there was a significant increase in the leaf weight and a significant reduction in the uh, stomatal number and uh, there is a uh, reduction in the uh, relative water content when it is subjected to excess leaf water loss. And then the salt stress uh, in the sealing stage uh, we have tested uh, so far. So, it gives uh, a very high salt stress. This is 200 millimolar salt is very high for rice. The wild type plants, they almost, they died whereas these seedlings can, they can tolerate uh, the uh, salt stress. So, these are uh, some of the results. In other cases, uh, in we have uh, in different stages of development. As I told, we are also targeting the protein phosphatase 2C and the Farnes L transferase because earlier studies they have shown that uh, although not in rice, but in Arabidopsis it was shown that if you make mutation of uh, the protein phosphatases, uh, you can produce a stress tolerant plant. And the Farnes L transferase by using antisense approach, it was demonstrated uh, long back. So, in the field condition also it can produce higher yields. And also this another gene uh, nuclear factor Y. When it is overexpressed, it can give uh, still uh, stress tolerance in the field. And one of the study reported that the microRNA 169 is controlling the expression of the nuclear factor YA. So, that is why we selected the microRNA 169 for editing. And also, uh, we are working with uh, cap binding proteins. These are involved in the uh, mRNA processing and they are also involved in the, uh, uh, the microRNA biogenesis. So, there are two important cap binding proteins are there. One is the cap binding protein 80 and another one is cap binding protein 20. So, when there is a mutation in these proteins and uh, the plants, they perform better under drought stress conditions. So, we are also working with uh, these genes in rice. So, these mutants are in uh, different stages. So, these are the different approaches either you uh, take an allied genotype and you mutate some of the genes for uh, stress tolerance and then see if we can produce a stress tolerant plant. An alternative approach is that you know uh, there are several plants, they are naturally stress resistant. Whether you can uh, mutate some of the genes to induce the domestication trait so that you have uh, stress tolerance is there, you get the plant which is uh, uh, accepted by the consumer. So, this is the Pokali rice, uh, you see that it is cultivated in the sea water inundated field, it is highly salt tolerance, but the grain quality, uh, many of the people may not uh, like the grain quality. So, whether uh, like this, you have several uh, genotypes which are highly stress tolerance, whether you can 
uh, modify some of the genes either improve their quality or yield whether you can use them for the purpose. So far like there are not many ex example any examples are there for this uh, purpose except for one example. So there are several uh, list of um, plants are there which are naturally stressed resistance whether you can uh, edit them for improving the stress tolerance is a question. So this uh, you might have many of you might have working with uh, genome editing might have studied the Dino or accelerated domestication publication which came uh, in 2018 wherein few genes have been edited in the wild tomato solanum pimpinelli folium to enhance the uh, yield of uh, this plant. So this plant is tolerant to salt stress and this plant is uh, tolerant to uh, uh, this um, uh, uh, disease resistance. So they uh, by editing these uh, different genes, they produce a phenotype which is maybe somewhat near to the domesticated plant phenotype. But when they analyzed the stress tolerance, they maintained uh, the uh, level of disease resistance which the Solanum pimpinellium folium had and also the salt tolerance uh, which the plant had. So this is an another approach wherein you use uh, a plant which is naturally stress resistance and use uh, edit genes which are not related to stress to produce uh, a plant which is highly stress tolerant. So these are a summary of the uh, um, uh, different approaches that is used in the genome editing. Uh, use either gain or loss of function mutants uh, by using uh, different editing technologies or use uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, base editing. You can also edit, uh, regulate the transcription by uh, either uh, the uh, promoter editing by creating, uh, inserting some elements or you do base editing to modify uh, some of the uh, cis elements. By this approach also you can alter the gene transcription and also you can uh, regulate, uh, do the post -transla translational regulation. That is the transcription is not affected but the translation product may have a different impact where you can alter uh, the splicing sites that is by base editing can be used uh, to modify the AG and CT so that uh, the splicing is altered or you can modify the upstream, uh, upstream uh, ORFs the small or before uh, present before the actual uh, initiation codon that will enhance the translation or you can put some of the translation enhancer in the genes for improving the stress tolerance. So to summarize uh, stress tolerance can be improved but you should understand it uh, properly and for example drought tolerance you can improve. You have to make a consistent effort that it is not that one shot you will get everything. But we should remember that uh, when you work with the essential environmental factors, you cannot uh, produce uh, grains without the input. That we should always rem remember. That many people say drought research is going on for several uh, years, nothing has happened. So it depends like what is the kind of stress. We cannot say nothing has happened. So some significant improvement is there even in the field condition. Uh, genotype which use less water have been produced but we should not uh, expect too much that is every output requires some input. Without uh, input we should not expect output. So the regulation part I think uh, it will be covered uh, by uh, Dr. S. R. Bhatt uh, in the coming days. So this example you might have studied. So far only the uh, calyx high oleic acid soybean is the uh, uh, like edited product which is uh, uh, the cultivated uh, in USA. Uh, but this is edited by using a talent technology to produce uh, high oleic acid. But so this uh, gives hope that other genome editing product can be used. In some countries there is uh, like uh, no regulation, uh, you can use the genome edited product free. But in our country there will be a regulation and this will be discussed uh, by uh, Dr. Bhatt. So last but not the least, uh, it is the question that gets you Nobel Prize. So after that you just add lab coats, coffee or air conditioning. So you ask the right question that is very important, other things or uh, all the tools are available, you can even if it is not in your, your place, you can access from the other uh, place 
or you can go in other place and work, but we should ask the right question for that. We should uh, uh, read a lot and think a lot. And uh, finally, I thank all my uh, lab people who are uh, working with me in uh, the genome editing as well as in the other projects and also uh, the funding support from uh, our institute as well as the National Agriculture Science Fund of ICR and uh, DBT Government of India which has funded uh, our work, our, the current projects on genome editing. And uh, another one important uh, Nobel Prize sentence I always use in my slide is, one who solves the problem of water is worth two Nobel Prizes, one for science and one for peace. So when, not only when you work with the, the stress, and otherwise also we try to conserve water because water is uh, a precious resource which is decreasing day by day. So we should work towards uh, saving the water. So that's all uh, uh, from my side. Although I have taken longer time, I thought I will uh, give that uh, uh, introductory part which is more important rather than the latter part of genome editing. In any case, you are listening uh, from all the speakers. So I thought uh, uh, we should understand the stresses and stress phenotyping uh, properly so that uh, we can produce better results. Thank you for your uh, passion and listening for almost two hours. <laughs> Sir, thanks for delivering the wonderful lecture. I, I have a question uh, regarding the stress tolerance. Uh, we are trying to enhance the uh, tolerance uh, to overcome the stress, but there are the species, uh, some species in which uh, stress is beneficial. Like uh, uh, there is a wild flax in which uh, wild wild flax. Okay, flax. Okay. Wild flax. Uh, it is a uh, case in the botany, and uh, uh, wild flax is able to. Uh, overcome the, uh, uh, there is a uh, type of the soil, serpentine soils, in which the calcium is uh, in the lowest amount. And uh, uh, this is one of the uh, aspect in which uh, it is uh, going to the toilet, but uh, there is a benefit that it is a, a help to uh, adapt in the, uh, to provide the decline in the uh, pathogen resistance. Uh, what we can do in this aspect uh, uh, in which the stress is beneficial and uh, harmful also? So, uh, see, if the stress is beneficial, it is good, no? You can uh, cultivate yeah. that crop in uh, those area, but in those crops, as I told in the last part of the slide, maybe those many plants, they are resistant to stress. Uh, and uh, whether you can improve, improve the uh, economic yield in those crops. So we need not uh, always work on the stress, no? We have to sometime work on the other part of the crop also. Like we can enhance the yield potential of those crop in those uh, where they are already stress tolerant, then we need not uh, worry about it. Like now people are thinking that uh, why only eat and rice, you grow cactus in uh, desert and use cactus as a food, modify the cactus so that some nutritional values can be added. So when the human population is increasing, we have to explore all the aspects. We cannot uh, say only improving stress tolerance is important. And also um, uh, the stress tolerance, as you study more and deeper, you get uh, like more and more question. Was often sometimes they may be tolerant to abiotic stress, but it may be sensitive to biotic stress. Same genes, it may control. Uh, like uh, the map kinase, if you take, uh, who is working on map kinase? Uh, so uh, you, it, it is there a map kinase, sometimes it increases tolerance, sometimes it uh, decreases tolerance, even between the uh, abiotic stress and uh, between the uh, biotic stress. So same gene can have a uh, diverse role, but in this case, the genome editing is a boon where you can engineer a lot of alleles. So in, you can engineer several alleles where you can make that protein work specifically under that condition as favorable and other condition uh, you can remove the non-favorable uh, uh, alleles or the regions of the protein that may interact with some of the other protein. So that in that way you have a lot of opportunity for uh, engineering. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
uh, sir, my question is regarding that uh, receptor mutation in uh, PVA, uh, ABA receptor. So the nature might have evolved a lot of receptors. So they may have some tissue specific or condition specific uh, <coughs> function in case of that receptors. So if we completely knock down that mu uh, receptors, we should analyze all the other parts also, right? So, because a lot of other situations may also arise in case of plants. So that's uh, that's what uh, like uh, these receptors. Earlier, uh, people thought that they uh, these receptors are redundant; they may have the same function. <coughs> but these studies they clearly showed that they uh, uh, every receptor they have some or other essential uh, role to play. Uh, in that paper, uh, if you find the study in detail, like this paper and uh, some of the uh, earlier one paper uh, where they overexpressed all the AB receptors. So these are studies wherein they completely analyzed all the receptor families. So you get uh, uh, very interesting phenotype when you overexpress and uh, when you do knock out the single receptor may not have any impact at one particular stage, but in other stage it may have uh, some impact. So in this, uh, that's why you have to create all possible combination of receptor and then we have to uh, see what is good. Like although those uh, receptor mutation, three receptor, uh, this triple mutant, 146 triple mutant, it is uh, like uh, and performing better under normal condition, but if any stress is there, it is not going to tolerate. Like if you are doing a controlled condition, say you are doing a vertical farming or precision farming where uh, you are sure that there is no stress, then we have to use those kind of mutations also where uh, it is possible. Like where the VV parry is not an issue. So you have to see what condition and then you have to select the gene. There is no single solution for the uh, every problem. So we have to uh, approach the problem um, bit by bit. Sir, I have a question in like uh, in my PhD. So I am getting one problem. I need your suggestion in that. So I am working in some photoperiodic gene. So I am doing uh, also stress phenotyping of that gene also. So what is happening? Uh, my uh, transient is getting early flowering in that case. So I want to expose uh, stress because as you mentioned that uh, whenever a stress we providing, we have to uh, make sure that each and every condition should be ideal. Like same for the both the like susceptible or transgenic in this case. So I'm getting early flowering. So at what time I should uh, like uh, look down key, whether this time I should give a stress, because in a vegetative stage or reproductive stage, if, if vegetative stage we give, give before the panicle emphasis. So in that case, my transgenic is giving emphasis earlier than wild type. So uh, how I can like uh, there I can improve the stress in that way. So uh, if it, it is what crop? Rice. So in rice, uh, depending upon the uh, like uh, crops, uh, about it takes uh, 30 days uh, when you see the panicle on the plant, uh, about 30 days before the reproductive phase starts. That is, the panicle start developing within the stem 30 days before. Normally, before that duration is, you can say, considered as vegetative duration. So if we can uh, know the flowering time and also one or two plants, if we check, uh, when uh, the panicle initiation starts, then you can decide whether your plant is in the vegetative phase. So in the vegetative phase stress, there will not be any difficulties because say in the initial yeah, seedling so stage, before the panicle initiation starts, if you give, it is only vegetative stress. It is not going to affect the panicle development or which decides the number of grains later. So that is possible. Only when we want to do uh, reproductive stage stress, you have to, uh, adjust only your uh, sowing time. Other than that, there is no yeah. option. Either you do sowing of your uh, planting of the wild type earlier yeah, or uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, transgenic plant later so that the panicle initiation phase matches in both the genotypes. So, but same means same condition, like? In yeah, in the same condition. Especially uh, when you, if you are using drought, you should understand uh, the um, like remember that you give uh, equal amount of soil moisture and if the plant uh, uh, sizes are different, 
then you can also do phenotyping in the same part if you want to know whether the, it is giving dehydration tolerance or dehydration avoidance. When normally when we do uh, plant wild type and transgenic in separate part, so uh, it uh, the tolerance we see in uh, transgenic may be because of the dehydration avoidance or dehydration tolerance both mechanism. But if you put in the same part, if you put transgenic as well as wild type, then mainly the difference if it comes it is because of the cellular tolerance mechanism because water is available there in the pot it is equally to both the uh, plants. So only if there is difference in the tolerance mechanism then you will see the difference. So you can do both the kind of experiment in the plant to see what kind of mechanism it contributes. Okay, if not, uh, let's thank Sir for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, let's go for a tea break, then we come back here at 12.15 or 12.20 for uh, starting the next session on student presentation. Okay. So, thank you all. <laughs>